fishermen in a remote Mozambican village feed the huge demand for shark fin soup. Villages like these exist purely to catch sharks. From here, the fins are taken to Maputo Harbor, bound for the Far East. Many nautical miles away on the southern tip of Africa, shark fins are of equal importance. But the mission of scientists here is to save the species. And they're doing that by studying images of the fins that often end up on a soup plate. Here in Khanspai, it is the fin of the great white shark that is of particular interest. A groundbreaking study is underway to determine the number of white sharks in the cage diving mecca of Khanspai. Tourists flood here, often with the perception that this is an area full flowing with great white sharks, thousands and thousands of them. And essentially, the numbers are a lot lower. Alison Tarner is one of a team of marine biologists and volunteer researchers from overseas who've just completed a study of the local shark population. She arrived here after a stint as a dive instructor on the Red Sea and says this is the best place in the world to research them. I knew from very young that South Africa was the place to be to see great white sharks. For Alison, it's the mystery of the creature that she finds so appealing. We still have no idea where this predator goes to breed and mate. The fact that they come inshore to areas like Dyer Island through seasonal parts of the year gives us such a perfect opportunity to look at them, but where and when they go from here and how long? Answers to those questions we're only just starting to get a hold on. Alison wouldn't be here at all if it wasn't for the interest and passion of Wilfred Chivell. Chivell runs a marine adventures operation in the town. He's also a shark enthusiast who initiated the study she's working on. We perceive it, and most on the planet after Jaws and so on, perceive this as an, a monster that wants to kill people. It'll jump on boats, it'll punch a boat, it'll do anything to get to you. It's not true. If you have crystal clear water and the temperature is good, you can dive with a great white. It's got an unwarranted reputation. I think now it's time to uh, brave these rather chilly waters and take a close-up look. Wilfred had long been interested in determining the number of great whites off Hans Bay. And the more time the researchers spent with sharks, the more pictures they took, enabling them to identify each animal. Wilfred says they had thousands of photographs. For the first few years, we just collected um, photo after photo after photo, many not good, many good. And then in 2010, I started to employ researchers, always with a view to eventually bring out a, a fin study. Such a study would help them to get an idea of the number of great whites in the Hanspai area. That is just an awesome sight, and the latest research shows just how rare it is. Oliver Jewell is another marine biologist with Wilfred's team. He says the task facing them was huge. Getting it off the ground and rolling from just pictures into an actual study and cataloging and trying to count these sharks was still to be done. The next stage was to identify the number of individual sharks. And this they did through a dorsal fin recognition system called Darwin. It allowed them to match fins based on the shape, size, and distinctive features. They were the first in the world to use Darwin on the great white. Obviously, white sharks are very distinctive in their fins, so we thought maybe this would work with our sharks and our pictures. And sure enough, we tried it. It worked and we were able to match or not match certain pictures of sharks from our database and so it began. Simply it was myself and a team of researchers present on this boat every single day who just used photography, standard um, dorsal fin photographs and we took it back onto shore to, to analyse using automated software. The man whose job it was to put that software to work is Dave Edwards. Better known as Ed, when he's not in Hans Bay, he's at home in England. On this project, my role was to go through all the photographs that the field team had taken, one by one, identify sharks and group them. And in the process, try not to succumb to insanity. Or at least just stay awake for most of it. You have to look at fin after fin after fin. So you can just imagine looking at 100 fins a day and comparing it with, with 200, 300, 400, 500 others. That becomes quite a job. Ed had analysed over 2,000 photographs. It was a project of extreme concentration and focus. Although it was limited to the population that returned to Khanspai every year, through the use of tagging, they could see where the sharks had migrated to. Some of those sharks that we photograph every single year have gone as far as 
uh, Madagascar, as far as sub-Antarctic islands, and are now on their way back. I'm looking at one at the moment that, that hopefully will be here in a few weeks. The truth is, uh, they're a very, very wide-ranging species. So after more than a decade, the team had come up with a shark population for Hans Bay. And it was that figure that was to change perceptions of the great white shark. The previous unsubstantiated great white shark population in the area had been estimated at the 2,000 mark. We came out with maximum model data just over 1,000, which, yeah, is half. So just how the researchers arrived at this figure? We identified 532 unique individuals in this region over the time period from 2007 to 2011. But then what we had to do was um, model that data in order to be able to estimate a regional population. The study takes into account the fact that the white shark population in the Khanspai Daya Island area migrates and that it brings other sharks back with it. Alison says they ran eight different models to arrive at a figure for the area with a confidence level of 95%. So we think that even though we identified 532, if we were to guess or estimate a population size for this region, we've put it between sort of 800 and uh, 1,002. This figure indicates the white shark is under serious threat, but the danger is far closer to home. In 1991, South Africa may have become the first country to legislate the protection of the great white shark, but that didn't prevent the substantial killing of the species in our own waters. Between 27 and 35 great white sharks is killed on an atoll coast every year, legally, even though it's a protected animal. I mean, that really upsets you. In this day and age where we have all the technology to our advantage, to still go and put nets that catch sharks, not, not deter them from coming into an area, but actually catch them and put drum lines out that catch them and kill them, that is, that is just not on. Wilfred says he acknowledges the need to keep bathers safe. However, if the nets kill sharks, especially his beloved great whites, he sees them as an unnecessary evil. He says the great whites still receive bad press. We definitely not on the many of great white sharks. That has been proven over and over and over again. It's an accident that happens through bad visibility, something that happened earlier. It's strange that if something happens and there was a shark involved, it's front page, front page, front page. We humans, we kill 15,000 on South African roads every year, and another 15,000 is murdered. And then the shark is the number one culprit. But the bottom line was that they now had a complete study, 10 years after Wilfred first thought of it, and three years after his team started its work. I wanted to say I, I kicked a lot of but <laughs> this was an, an project, but a side project for the students, so they didn't really concentrate on it. And for me, I wanted it done, I wanted it done, I wanted it done. And it was a massive relief once it was done. Wilfred had achieved his mission, and despite the low numbers, the accomplishment brought with it an optimism, for they now had something to work with. It was great. We had, we had effectively done the most part of the study. We had got an end value. And now the result of the work can be put to use, replicated around the country. There are regional studies already being done in Fulce Bay, in Mossel Bay and Port Elizabeth. Together we can maybe produce a national estimate and maybe we're on the way to a global estimate. What would it mean, Ollie, if, if the Great White was removed from our waters uh, forever? It could have dire consequences. If we look at, say, one of the main prey sources for white sharks, Cape Fur Seals, their population is going up and up. So if there's no white sharks to moderate that population, then fish stocks become under threat because they'll eat more fish. Seabirds such as penguins and cormorants get killed by seals quite regularly. We could also lose an African penguin. In fact, I know if the white shark goes, the African penguin will go with it for sure. Which would be tragic. As researcher Dave Edwards put it, once you get to know the great white, it's hard to forget. Nothing can really prepare you for just how magical that first experience with the great white shark really is. How is that traffic? Are you kidding? Seeing them under the water like that? You can't beat it. There's really only one word for it, and that's perfection. The global population of white sharks is estimated at between five and 8,000. If you consider that we're talking about a population of between 600 and just over 1,000 here in Khans Bay, and it's a global hotspot, 
then this animal could be in serious need of protection.